Hello and welcome to this third edition of Not Another Book Review, the podcast where our guests will share concepts or ideas they have read about in books and their experiences of applying those concepts in real life. Much like our approach to consultancy, theory is all well and good, but it's the application that matters. Today, I'm joined by Helen Moulinos, Chief Executive of Power, a charity that provides advocacy, advice and support for people who find it hard to express their views or get the support they need human rights and entitlements. Helen, thank you so much for joining us. Well, and thank you for having me. So you've chosen to talk to us about the concept, Eat That Frog, outlined in a book by the same name by Brian Tracy. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the term, Eat That Frog, as Helen and I were both uh, completely oblivious to it before we read the book, it was originally coined by Mark Twain, who said, eat a live frog first thing in the morning and nothing worse will happen to you for the rest of the day. Um, there is some debate about whether he actually said that or not, but, uh, but that's, uh, that's the myth of where it comes from. And in the book, Brian Tracy uses it as a metaphor for effective time management. So Helen, tell us a little bit more about the concept and why it appeals to you. Sure. Um, I must admit, it's a phrase I had never heard of until I read this book. Um, I don't know anyone who uses that phrase either in you know, personal or professional life. Um, the book was rent- recommended to me, and I must admit, it's a book I hate to love and love to hate. Um, there are parts of it that really appeal to me and others that don't. I think the concept of eat that frog to a night owl like myself Um, is quite a foreign one. Um, In some ways, the book is very much written for morning people and morning larks who um, can get up and get going and do these amazing things between, I don't know, 7 to 10 a.m. in the morning. Um, I'm somebody who does my best work probably after 11 a.m. and probably in some ways, although I like the concepts of the book, I've had to adapt them quite a bit. So um, I tend to eat that frog and do the hardest thing of the day, probably between three and six. Um, But actually, there's a lot of things about the book that I do and have adopted in my sort of management practice um, and other things that, you know, I haven't adopted because they haven't really uh, resonated with me. The best approaches are always the ones that can be adapted to suit our needs. Very rarely we can lift things straight out of books. Um, Excellent. So we talked a little bit when we were preparing for this about the the 80-20 rule Mm -hmm. uh, that he talks about in the book. Tell us a little bit more about your experience of applying that particular principle. Yeah, so really this is about 20% of your activities accounting for 80% of your results. So this is picking and choosing, being involved in the right things um, to get the desired impact. Um, I think the 80-20 rule naturally sits with me. Um, In my role as a chief exec, my time is, is quite finite. So I have to really pick and choose what I'm involved with. Um, sometimes this does go awry and my own colleagues will tell you, I can sometimes get involved in things that are far too operational. Um, so that's always a, a good reminder for me, you know, to kind of uh, have that 80, 20 rule I- involved. And so many of the, the concepts in the book are, I suppose, what we would consider very common sense. Yes. He applies phrases to it like set the table, write out your, your goals and objectives in advance, mm. plan the day in advance. Mm. Uh, so some of it is, 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 is incredibly simplistic. But I know we've all had, you know, clangers when it comes to doing those things in the past. You write down your plan for the day and it goes completely to pot. Have you got any tips for people who might set out with all best intentions to do those things, but... Yeah have new things that crop up every day sure um i think setting the table has been sort of a lifelong process that i've been toying around with so in my personal life um i have this routine every year of the purchase of the annual planner and i'm a a big lover of a hardback you know physical planner that i can write in 
And when I think about that planner and buying that planner every year, I always set a number of personal goals for myself and I write them down. I tape them into the back of the book um, and I even sort of check in with myself every few months to see how I'm doing against that. On a professional basis, um, because my past is very much as a change management strategy professional, forward planning comes very naturally to me. I think what's changed over the years is as a chief exec, I don't really have the time to write really lengthy project plans and um, work out all the steps to my goal. Um, so the concept of setting the table is maybe looks a little bit different in my working life now. So as we're talking, I'm just looking at a board in my office. And in my office, I have this giant magnetic board. Um, and I have these magnets that are really, um, they only fit one sentence per magnet. And what I do now is I've got almost what's known as a Kanban board for anybody who's listening to this. And I've got to do doing a waiting review and done. And one of the things I love doing is writing my to-do list out on this magnet because it's this large board. I have to face it every single day. So I can't be on the phone without looking at this board. I can't walk into my office without looking at this board. And I can't walk out of the office without walking past it. So you can imagine that the physical activity of moving my to-do list from to-do, doing, awaiting, review, and done is a physical task that actually helps me to set the table every week. So I quite like coming in early in the morning and then setting that table for the day and saying, which of these things can I tackle? Um, which of these goals are short term? Which of them are longer term? The other thing I have with these magnets, which will make you laugh, um, and this is maybe sort of how I've adapted it, is I don't just have magnets with the tasks. I have emoticon magnets to actually put that go next to the tasks, which um, describe how I'm feeling about that. So if we think about eat that frog, the tasks that I hate the most have really grim faces next to them. Um, and that all actually helps me to organize my day. So I try to do a couple of tasks that feel good, come naturally, and other tasks which are more grim and unpleasant for me. Um, so I do try to eat that frog every time I sort of hit that board and sort of set that table. Um, but but yeah, so that's how I sort of, and those magnets move around depending on the week, the day, and, and what else is happening in the charity. That is absolutely fantastic. I have organizational envy now. <laughs> uh, I have something very similar, but it's on a, an electronic Kanban board and I have the days of the week across the top and yeah. then I can drag tasks in and I color code them by what type of activity it is. You know, the, the, the green being the most important, the client things and then sales yeah. and marketing and then internal stuff. Um, that's even more organized. Yeah, that's amazing. Oh, I, I like your emoticons. That would be that would be really, really good. And the order is supposed to be the order I do them in, um, much like eat that frog and we have a daily priority at Odessi. Uh, everybody sets their daily priority. The one thing you have to do above everything else, you might be with a client all day, but actually you have to call this one person back or you you have to do this one task. Yeah. So that's how we try and tackle it. But um, uh, there's another concept in the book, isn't there, about if there are more than one frogs or more than one priority you have to do in a day, you have to eat the, the the analogy sort of fades a bit after a while. You have to eat the biggest, ugliest frog first. Yes. The, the biggest, hardest job. Do you find that possible? No. And I think the reason why is because sometimes the ugly frogs need a bit of reflection time. And so that is one of the things in the book that I sort of are very counterintuitive to me. Because I think I like to reflect on the ugly frog and actually say, um, what is it? What, what am I trying to actually achieve here? And why am I eating this frog? And am I the right person to eat this frog? And do I have the right skills and experience? And do I know everything before? So, you know, I, I tend to be a bit of an overthinker sometimes. Um, now, some people might say that's procrastination, but I don't know. I don't know that it is procrastination. I think it's about being very thoughtful um, about how one does things. So maybe some of the bits of the book that are like really intuitive and just go get them. And I just think mm, not actually leaping into things is not always the best way forward. So I think that's part of the book that I disagree with. And that's probably where that, that approach aligns with your uh, night lark. Uh, style because the book is very much as you say geared towards morning people and you get in and you do that that big you eat that big ugly frog <laughs> first thing in the morning um, and it doesn't work if you're a night uh, night lark but yes, if you yes. are somebody that likes to reflect and plan and be very considered about the big ugly frog you're going to eat 
yeah. you would then tackle that last thing at night potentially before you sign off for the day yes. late in the day yes I also think that Brian Tracy, who writes the book, um, was a salesman by profession. And that's where he gets a lot of the ideas is he studies like really effective salespeople. And I think that's another part of the book that's a little bit flawed. So if you have jobs like you have, Rhiannon, or I have, you know, we're expected to multitask at a very high level. And so one of the challenges I think I have with this book is if you're very single stranded, it's very possible. You know, he talks about um, concepts like create large chunk of times where you can concentrate for extended period on these important tasks. Well, the real world doesn't work that way, whether it's our professional or personal lives, we're constantly interrupted and probably half of what goes on is unplanned and unforeseen. So part of it is the book doesn't really give you a guideline for how to deal with the unexpected. And there is so much unexpected in our lives. So um, that's the bit I couldn't relate to because I thought, well, I try to create large chunks of time, but I'm, I'm interrupted just by, you know, the very effect that there's this thing called the, the world and the universe, you know, which I can't control. Absolutely. And I suppose that's where using a technique like a Kanban board with, yep. with, with the concepts in the book, makes it more manageable because yes, yes you might intend to do these three tasks in a day and here's the chunks of time I have but as a chief executive your diary can change with very minimal notice things come in need your attention and that allows you then to in your case and like I say very envious physically move that item over to the next day so you don't lose sight of those things that are important but yes. it is adapting the techniques that they talk about but with yes. one eye on the fact that we live in the real world and, and you know, you're not making sales calls. <laughs> yes. I think another part, Rhiannon, of running a charity, one of the concepts that Brian Tracy talks about is developing a, a sense of urgency around your priority tasks. And sometimes in a role like the one I have, um, people have different views about what your priorities are. So that might be your colleagues, um, the staff, volunteers, the beneficiaries of the charity. Um, stakeholders in the public domain, your trustees. Um, so everyone has an opinion about what your urgent um, tasks are and what priorities are. Um, so sometimes navigating around that is really tricky, you know. So so that's quite interesting as well um, when I think about the developing a sense of urgency. Any tips for doing that? I know there'll be a lot of people listening that, that will really resonate with. Uh, how do you manage that? Um, I'm not sure I manage it very well. I think it's something I'm, I'm always working on and always developing. I think a very busy diary um, means that there's not a lot of choices about my time. Uh, I think what I try to do is sort of empower and trust, you know, people who work for me. Um, I have this view about what a charity looks like in reality. And I have this take on power, which is that it's a bit like an orchestra. I'm the conductor. There are tuba players, there are violinists, there are percussionists, um, and so on. And we're all, what keeps us together is a common goal. You know, it's that sheet music. We're all playing the same piece, just different parts of it. And we all bring different skills and experience to it. So again, with that conductor anal analogy, I don't know everything. I don't have the right skills for everything. There are lots of people who will be specialists. So I think, really managing priorities is about getting the right group of people in the room um, and empowering people to be able to take the lead. So I'm a big believer in non-hierarchical leadership and sort of, you know, empowering people again around a common set of rules and guidelines uh, to be able to, to fulfill what the, what the charity does. Um, I think the other thing is also, you know, we have 423 staff, about 115 volunteers. I can't be in all places at once. So having a very good management team, you know, that works alongside me is important. They have their own sort of specialties as well. But yeah, so I don't think I have any great wisdom about it, really. I think I think that, that delegation where appropriate is, is a good tip. Um, it's certainly something, yes. it cropped up in one of the other book reviews we did actually. And um, it's one of those concepts that I understand and yet it's hard to get sucked into it sometimes. So I have excellent uh, marketing 
people at Odessi and I need to just let them get on with it and yeah I find it quite interesting <laughs> so I get sucked in so I realize that a lot of their time sometimes is spent managing me um, as opposed to le letting them get on with it. Um, Same and I think also it's sometimes hard um, you know I was talking with one of my colleagues the other day and we're working on a particular um, piece of film content and sometimes it's really hard to articulate to somebody what you have in your head and expect that they're just not like superheroes who can read your mind and scan your mind. So, yeah, I think finding that right balance of being involved, you know, setting the scene for what you're looking for without taking over is often hard as leaders. Yeah. And then I suppose one last sort of question from me, the book in the later stages talks about enablers and constraints. So it says, you know, identify mm -hmm. your constraints. And then it talks about technology as being either a, um, a, a liability, something that eats your time or something that can enable you. Have you found there are any, any main constraints that reading the book has made you become aware of that you can manage or any particular enablers? I mean, you and I, we're both, um, you know, visual management people. So obviously your board mm -hmm. is a big enabler for you to remain productive and to, to follow the concept yes. and eat that frog. Any thoughts on that? Um, this year, the pandemic has been really interesting. So I've probably been able to get to know more colleagues and more stakeholders um, under lockdown than I would have if I was traditionally just sitting on a train and traveling up and down the country. So in a lot of ways, you know, video conferencing has been this really powerful uh, enabler. And also um, if we think about sort of the digital world um, and the rise of what I would call the armchair activists here in Britain, you know, how many, people can you mobilize and empower around the country to be able to again amplify the work of the charity so giving people it's the fastest way to give in people information the fastest way um, for people to sign a petition or get involved in a campaign or actually um, express their voices about what's going well or what isn't going well so technology has been incredible for that you know the amount of um, miles and people we can cover um, and also in terms of advocacy services, you know, some of our advocacy services have been virtual during the pandemic. And although it's not possible to deliver advocacy in all situations, you know, virtually, um, that's been really powerful. So our ability to grow our reach, you know, we reached over 420,000 people last year between our help hubs and also one-to-one -one advocacy. That's huge for, you know, a charity like ours. Um, the downsides of technology is this idea, I think, and one of the personal constraints that I often struggle with, and, and this is a well-being constraint, is this idea of being always on. So um, I find one of the bad habits I've developed is like checking my email when I'm off on a day off or because it's so easy to do. You don't have to go to a physical computer like you would have 10 years ago, you know, in this world of Office 365, Microsoft, you can just check your email at any point. So you could dive back into work quite easily. I think that that's a real downside of technology and a real constraint um, on a personal and professional level. I also think um, we've had the rise of the troll as well through technology. So the fact that, you know, anyone can write to anyone and just say anything I find is really worrying particularly when a lot of the trolling that we see online wouldn't occur in the real world. Like, you know, in a lot of those situations, you know, would somebody just walk up to someone and insult them that way or, you know, harass them in that way? So, yeah, I, I see sort of upsides and downsides. Um, I'm a great lover of technology, um, but also can see how maybe, in, in, you know, we have lost our way in terms of the quality of human relationships. Um, and it has been diluted. And I think we have to acknowledge that as well, that there are trade-offs. Fantastic. Thank you. And uh, last thing, I promise, um, finish this sentence for me. You should apply the concepts from eat that frog if... <laughs> if you're a procrastinator. <laughs> I love it. That's brilliant. Helen, thank you so much. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we finish? No, that's great. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about eat that frog. I've had a great time. Thanks, Rihanna. Thank you. And for anybody that's listening, Eat That Frog by Brian Tracy is available from all good bookshops 